seat. Welcome to the Lord's house tonight. It's kind of blustery on the outside, and now, it, even though we had an extra hour of sleep, it all feels like we're late because it feels like it's 8 o'clock. But we're glad that you're here, and let's worship the Lord together. He's worthy of our praise. <laughs> Let's begin in a word of prayer. Brother Chuck Cape, would you lead us in prayer, please? into this house to worship him.
why you came, but I hope by now you're worshiping the Lord tonight. He's majestic. He's honorable. He's worthy of our very best. Let's sing this song, Majesty. the whole world in his hands. We mentioned this song this morning in at least one of the sermons, so let's sing it together tonight, and let's don't have to start over. Y'all are really warmed up good tonight. I think the last time we did this song, we sang it very first, and y'all were really cold and, and stiff-necked and hard-hearted, but tonight, you're ready, Marcus, so let's go. Jonathan let's sing it. wanted this song sung. Tonight, Jonathan so. wanted it sung. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So let's... <laughs> Joey. I, I, all, right, <laughs> all right, all right. You better do them where you are, Joey. But so if you okay, because if not, I'll bring you up here. All right, he's got the whole world. <laughs>
praise one more time. Amen. We'll sing one more song. I sing praises, and it's also a medley with Glorify Thy Name. people said amen and you may be seated and we are so thankful to be in the Lord's house tonight and for you to be here and be a part of what God has going on and for us to be a part of it together we thank you for your participation not just being a spectator event to be in worship together but to participate in what God is doing we've been preaching in Matthew we're preaching most recently in Matthew 13 of these parables that are here and we've been seeing these uh, parables that deal a lot with agriculture, and that may not be our, our, our natural environment anymore for most people, but Jesus is speaking to those who have understood what it meant to have a crop and have our life revolve around a crop and the seasons of planting and tilling before that and then cultivating and caring and eventually nearing and reaching a point of harvest and celebration. He tells a parable about a sower and the fact that as we sow seed, there are different kinds of ground that 
the, the seeds fall on. And some commentators would say this deals with the breadth of the kingdom, that there's all sorts of different environments for seed to fall on that the sower sows into. And then we saw today, this morning and even last Sunday night, the parable of the wheat and the tares, or as the disciples say, it's the parable of the weeds, the parable of the tares. And they say, let us understand the problem of weeds and the harvest. Not just that a harvest is hard to get going, but but the weeds are what kind of grab our attention and focus upon us. And so we saw that Jesus said, don't worry so much about the weeds. The harvest goes all the way to the end. And you need to know that Jesus is building a harvest in you and through you and around us that will abide to the end. And some would say that deals with the length of the kingdom of God. That you, if you are born again in Jesus Christ, you are born again. And you are saved and you will be saved as you are being saved. Christ work is effective in you through the blood of Jesus Christ. And tonight we're going to look at another parable, the parable of the mustard seed, which would deal in some sense with the height of the kingdom of God, that God's kingdom is an overarching kingdom. It's a tall and impressive kingdom, but it doesn't start that way. This great structure of a kingdom that will be seen by many and received by some, but respected in the end by all, is a kingdom that starts very small. The Bible tells us, and we remember a song from childhood, that little is much when God is in it. We had a great time together, the men did, just a few moments ago as we had our business meeting, and then we had prayer and talked about some mission opportunities in our church among those who are elderly and uh, the widows and those kinds of needs. And we testified of some other things and things that were on our heart. And I thought Brother Jerry was going to preach my sermon tonight. And near the end of his testimony, he even mentioned, he said, you know, little is much when God is in it. Now, he didn't know that was the sermon for tonight, but the Holy Spirit knew that that was the sermon for tonight. As uh, one uh, preacher I was studying this week said, John MacArthur was the one who said, about this particular text. Jesus doesn't interpret this parable for us like he does the parable of the sower and the parable of the weeds, but the Holy Spirit does. And so tonight we come being verified and ratified in our spirits together in worship and even in preparation through prayer that God's Holy Spirit is here and he's speaking to us and he will give us liberty to preach this sermon tonight little as much when God is in it. If you will stand to your feet, we're going to honor God. We're going to read two simple verses of Scripture from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greater than all the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that your word is your word. It's not ours. We didn't create it. This is not an opportunity for us to invent or create truth. God, this is an opportunity for us to rely upon the power of your Holy Spirit to speak to us and through us and into the world. The truth of a glorious gospel. Lord, a truth conveyed through parables and pictures. That your kingdom is a kingdom that begins small. Lord, it will grow tall and it will be ultimately identified but not necessarily received by all people. But God, no one can argue with the greatness of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray for you in your Holy Spirit and your will tonight to save someone, to change each one of us that we would not leave here the way we came in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Another parable is the way the text starts tonight. He said, oh, no, another parable. Here's, here's one more. <laughs> there are many. There are several in this stretch, as we saw last week, sort of the central part as we would divide it up of the Gospel of Matthew, this pivotal moment where now people have begun to sway away from Jesus, those who had thronged toward him. 
because of his authoritative claims and also now even because of their confusion over what it was exactly he was asking of them, some would begin to wander away. We saw last week and this week in the first part of chapter 13 and the latter part of chapter 13 that the multitudes were scratching their head and let's not be too judgmental because even the disciples were doing some head scratching as to try to understand what this was all about because they thought that when they saw Jesus, the one proclaimed by John the Baptist and ratified by the Father's voice and the descending of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, they thought this is the one, this is the Messiah, the kingdom is here, and by that they didn't mean what Jesus meant when he talked about a kingdom. They were jumping ahead. You ever known somebody that always wanted to get ahead of the story? They want to get all the way to the end and miss the middle ground. And what they had to understand was this kingdom was going to start very small. As I mentioned earlier, as a child, there was a song that I remember hearing, hearing sung in church. The song was written in 1924. It is entitled, Little as Much When God is in it by Kitty Suffield. In the harvest field now ripened, there is work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to the harvest, calling you. Little as much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem too small and little known? It is great if God is in it. And he'll not forget his own. Anybody know it? Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say, if we are faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown, and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. The kingdom starts small. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. A tiny, small seed the beginning of something huge. The problem with us is we always want to start big, don't we? <laughs> we have these grandiose ideas, these bigger-than-life visions, and we often preach to one another, encourage one another that without a vision, the people perish. And I know what we mean. We need to understand that God has a vision and a direction and we're going, but often we skip the stage of the incubation. <laughs> we skip the stage of the preparation. We skip the stage of what God is doing to ready us and ready others for what he's doing in their life and in the world. And Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this mustard seed. A man took this little tiny seed, which verse 32 says is the least of all seeds, and he planted it. Now see, one of the things we have a tough time is even appreciating small things. Some smart alecks and people who think they know better try to research and say, well, the mustard seed is not really the smallest of all seeds. And they would try to diminish the accuracy of, of who Jesus is and the, the activity of Jesus in the world to even understand this. But in research, I found this. This will bore some of you and, and perhaps encourage others. Dr. L.H. Shinner's 
director of the herbarium at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, and lecturer in the Smithsonian Institute, stated in a conversation that the mustard seed would have indeed been the smallest of those seeds noticed by people in the time of Jesus Christ. The principal field crops of wheat and barley and lentils and beans have much larger seeds as do other plants which might have been present, such as weeds and so forth. There are various weeds and wildflowers belonging to the mustard, amaranth, pigweed, chickweed families with seeds that are very small, but these are not crop seeds. They would not have been noticed nor appreciated. When Jesus is speaking about seeds, he's speaking about that which would have the expectation of the people in his day to have produced a harvest that they would have needed and that they would have looked forward to. The only modern crop that anyone has found that would have rivaled this would be that of the American tobacco plant, which is not number one food and is also number two, not even in the region of this area. Dr. Shinners says that this indeed is the smallest of seeds. And again, one commentator says, isn't it wonderful that when, the, when Jesus talks about seed, he's right. <laughs> So many people want to argue about so many things, and we will no doubt hear much of that this week. Slicing and dicing and dissecting and giving commentary on all sorts of things as if we are experts. When in fact, if we want to understand what it means to live in the kingdom, we need to know that Jesus is the expert on what it takes to grow his crop and his kingdom. In spite of the apparent smallness of this kingdom, we live in a kingdom that has infinite power, even though it starts very small. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. Sometimes it's those small things, those things that we do that nobody notices, the things that we do that the world does not applaud for nor appreciate that God is using not only in our life but in the lives of others. It's the small consistencies, the things that you do day after day after day, like reading your Bible and praying, like saying thank you and please, <laughs> like being polite to people that you expect nothing in return from whatsoever, that are planting kingdom seeds, very small, small but not insignificant seeds in other people's life. Jesus said the kingdom is like a small seed. This mustard seed would have been a seed of a plant that primarily in their day and time would have been valued because of the oil that would have been derived from it. And they plant this seed and this plant grows up. There are different varieties of mustard, but there are mustard plants that grow into large tree-like things. Old commentators from long ago said that they were known to even be so high that a man on a horse could ride underneath the limbs of the branch of a mustard tree if it were fully mature and fully grown. All that from a tiny, tiny seed. As the men got together and prayed tonight, and you'll perhaps tire of that, but if you get tired of it, then you get together with somebody and pray and talk with them, and you come back and you can talk about it, and we'll be glad to listen to you. The men were talking about simple things, simple, simple efforts in the name of Jesus that we can do. <laughs> Providing a meal. Pruning a shrub. Providing some encouragement, making a phone call, being a listening ear. Things that are often misunderstood. As saying, well, you're just trying to do the work. Well, listen, we're not doing the work ahead of the gospel. The gospel is ahead of the work. God is calling us to enter into this harvest field of a gospel with small things. The kingdom starts small. It started in Mary. It started long before Mary, but we know the Christmas story as it comes upon us. It started small. It was Jesus Christ who was born as a promise and given in a Bethlehem manger. He was small as an infant. And many people thought, well, can anything good for, come from that place? Can anything worthwhile happen there? But Jesus was God's seed. Born to man and grew without sin and died on the cross and he was buried and planted for us and he rose as the first fruits of the resurrection so that we might know <laughs> that every man, woman, boy, and girl has the potential to receive Jesus Christ even though small things 
may be all that they see around them now. One preacher I heard this week said that some people would say, well, our church only has X number of people, fill in the blank, on a Sunday night. I don't know if there are 20 people here or so. That's okay if there are. It's okay if they're not. But some people might, well, there's only 20. Listen, the Bible tells us that Jesus made it to the cross with only 11. And every one of them ran away. At his ascension to the right hand of the Father, there were essentially only 120. There were only a few that were there. Some would say our church only has 120. We're a part of a kingdom that God has grown and that God is growing, but it started small. It starts small, yes, but it grows tall. This seed sprouts from the ground and it grows and it reaches forth to the skies. And we sit here 2,000 years later after this infant child born in a Bethlehem manger who was killed on Golgotha's hill for the sin of the world and proclaimed dead by the potentates and the governments. And a seal was placed upon his tomb and said he will stay dead. This small gospel, frail and fragile, feeble by the estimation of the world, born again out of a resurrection tomb on that first Easter, has sent the Holy Spirit to those who were assembled in the upper room and a power unlike any power that's ever been. We live in my day and time in an atomic age. It's the only age I've ever known. <laughs> the age of seemingly unlimited power. An age where my entire life people have mentioned and continue to worry about the fact that we now seemingly have the ability to obliterate our planet and our existence because of the power we think we have. But I would like to juxtapose that in your mind for just a moment with the reality that yes, I guess in some ways mankind thinks we've invented that kind of power or discovered that kind of power. But Jesus was the one who invented all the atoms of all the world. And without him, not a single molecule of this entire planet would hold to be in its existence. And no matter how much we think we know that we have mastered death, what we know in this day and time is we have not mastered hell. We cannot propagate and prolong and perpetuate life. But Jesus Christ, that small seed of a gospel that came and that lived and that died and that rose again and now forever intercedes at the right hand of the Father is the one who says, he who believes in me shall never die. I want to ask you, do you believe that tonight? <laughs> because that's the height of the gospel that reaches up toward the heavens and overshadows all the fields of the world <laughs> with a hope that is more expansive and more complete and more real than any of the so-called hope that our world has for it. This kingdom is the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom that the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation will come to an end, will come to its full fruition one day as this world is ending, as things are seemingly getting worse. We will find that the kingdoms in verse 15 of chapter 11, it says the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat on the thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God. This is a tall, tall tree. A tall, powerful gospel in a kingdom. We give you thanks, O Lord, the one who is, and the one who was, and the one who is to come, because you have taken your great power, and you have reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come in the time of the dead, and they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Jesus Christ will reign forever and ever and ever. And after that, you can just keep adding more forevers. The kingdom grows tall. 
Out of the least of all the seed, that which is grown is greater than all the other herbs. There's no kingdom, no king which will rival him. No solution, no extension of life that will rival him. He's greater than all the herbs, and it becomes a tree. And verse 32 tells us something strange that happens. So that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. This kingdom starts small. This kingdom grows very tall. And the kingdom will benefit all, whether or not they acknowledge it or not. See, I'm not preaching to you tonight a gospel where everybody gets saved. There will be many, as we saw this morning, who will be gathered as the weeds and thrown into the furnace and burn in the fire with wailing and gnashing of teeth. And that's horrific. But see, the glory of the kingdom is that the opportunity is there for everybody. Extended to them. God is not willing for any to perish, but all come to know him. Some believe in one way this parable could be interpreted well well the birds they're they're kind of demonic these birds are are evil these are the birds that came and plucked away the seed I, i'm not convinced of that interpretation of this some would interpret it well these are all the gentiles and they come and flock to the tree and there's all kind of gentiles and they'll find rest there and i guess we could interpret it that way we we as we said earlier don't have jesus definitive interpretation of that but I don't think we have to go that far either. What we can simply say is the tree is there for everybody. The tree is there for those that want to rest underneath the shade. The tree is there for those that want to reside in the limbs. The tree is there as a provision and a place of refuge. The birds of the air come and they nest in its branches. I do think that God offers himself on a tree for each of us. He is not perpetually dead, but his death is per perpetually sufficient for us. He is alive. He is a living tree. If you take time and go into the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, we see an illustration of how the Jews were promised that the restoration of Israel would be like a tree a spring and a cedar tree that would be cultivated and grow and the Gentiles and the nations would find hope in this tree. I think maybe in that direction is the best way to go to understand that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the hope of Israel and the only hope for Gentiles. Yes, that we can come and find salvation and find the sustenance that in this tree, no doubt there were seeds. <laughs> Future trees. There was a sustenance. There was a, a meal to be had. And there was a place for these birds to rest. And they would nest in its branches. We as God's people understand that the kingdom of God ought to be a blessing to everybody. Just as Jesus told us last Sunday night and we heard him say that we don't go through the harvest field trying to cull wheat and tares. We don't have time. We don't have that talent. We don't have time to waste nor the talent to intricately separate wheat and tares because we will mess up wheat while we're trying to rid the tares. We're not ignoring that tares are there. We're not saying the tares are good. We are saying that what Jesus says is enough. And what we know is this great tree is a benefit to all. Can I tell you that lost and dying people are being benefited by the kingdom of God right now? There are a lot of people who've been given water from wells because Christians cared. Now, I want to tell you that not all those people are going to heaven. There are a lot of people who be fed by meals because Christians care and because the canopy of the tree of the kingdom spreads across the world. But let me tell you, not all those people will receive Jesus and go to heaven. Say, well, should we do all this? See, I think that's why Jesus is telling these parables because the disciples were going to have to look square in the face of reality and say, well, is it worth it? Is it worth it to give? Is it worth it to go? Is it worth it to suffer? And Jesus says, yes, it's worth it because people need this kind of kingdom. They don't need a kingdom of reciprocation. You do for us and we'll do for you. You love us and we'll love you back. They don't need a kingdom of manipulation where we try to say, 
you do some and we'll do less and you do more and we'll do just enough to get you to do more again. They don't need that. The world needs a kingdom, the kingdom of the gospel, the kingdom of Jesus that overstretches and brings shadow and sustenance to the entire world and safety for them where they can come and find true refuge in Jesus if they will. Can I tell you a secret? I've been pastoring long enough to know that sometimes people just want the church because they just want their bills paid. Or they just want a meal on a Wednesday night. And as Brother Jerry shared, what we know is there's a sneaky little secret that we have some children that get on our church van every Wednesday because they, they just want to play kickball. But you know, that's okay. Because this kingdom we're in is tall. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot of birds flying to the branches and find a place to make a nest. Maybe all those birds aren't going to be saved. But some are. And so if we can just be plain enough, Jerry and I will say it's okay if they want to come on Wednesday to just play kickball. Because no matter why they're coming, we know why we're coming. And they may play kickball and come to have fun, but they're going to leave being told that Jesus is the seed. <laughs> Jesus is the answer. And his way is the only way. Brother Keith and Sister Candy would agree with me that they are some who come just because they want to know if we're going to have chicken and dumplings one more time. And that's okay. Because when they come to get chicken and dumplings, some of them are going to find out. They'll all hear. Some will receive that Jesus is the only way. Preacher, are you really going to say that God cares about chicken and dumplings and kickball and all the other little silly things that we do around here from time to time that seem so insignificant and small? Yeah, <laughs> I do. This morning after early, well, after the two services were over, a couple of the ladies in our children's ministry came and said, Pastor, you know, some of the kids were picking up on the church van. They, they don't know we don't cook breakfast anymore. Can, can we figure out a way somehow to get a biscuit or something we can put in the microwave for about 20 kids? Well, we're going to have church conference tonight and we'll form a committee and we'll get together and we'll see what it'll cost and run the expenses and we will see. Do y'all think that's what we're going to do here? No. Sister Amy, our church treasurer, happened to be walking by. I said, Amy, surely we can find the money in the budget to buy some breakfast. She said, yes, it's there. And I said to these two ladies, I said, now here's the only thing. I said, I, the money's the easy part most of the time. I said, oh, if you, if you give us the okay, it'll be done. <laughs> and some hard-hearted, crotchety person somewhere in this room or somewhere on the other side of the world saying, preacher, do you think biscuits and sausage is the answer? <laughs> well, it's part of the tree. Jesus is the answer. <laughs> but he gives us an opportunity to do small things, <laughs> to fill up a little hungry place in the life of children who come on a Sunday morning without having been fed. Somebody said, well, well didn't we tell them we're not serving breakfast? Well, sure. That don't mean they don't get hungry. <laughs> you go home tonight and tell yourself, you didn't have supper, and you will say, yes, I didn't. Let's find some. This tree overarching into the field and into the world provides shade and sustenance and safety for all the little birds to come. They don't all get saved. But some do. 
And I praise God for a harvest field that's ripe. And these little birds don't care if there's a pandemic or a crisis. They don't care <laughs> if we're too busy or too scared. The opportunity is now. The fields are ripe now. The chorus of that song says, if we labor not for wealth or fame. There is a crown, and we can win it. But we labor in Jesus' name. It's not about Bethesda. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. And he's worthy. Praise God for the songs we sang tonight in our worship, that we could focus our attention upon Jesus and his worthiness and his majesty and his hugeness. The kingdoms of this world are passing away. The kingdom of our God and King will last forever. And I ask you tonight, I ask, ask us together, what would we trade from this world to gain converts in eternity? God is calling us to realize we are in a huge, growing kingdom of possibilities. Let's not despise small things. Whatever the small things are in your life, let's do them. Let's do them for the glory and the honor of God. Let's not turn our back nor our hand away from anything that God brings to our attention. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and stand to your feet. Lord, as we stand before you tonight, we ask you to speak to us about this kingdom. Lord, we ratify again that it is wonderful to be a part of a kingdom that is so huge and so glorious and growing. God, we may not see it day to day, and we may not see it based on what we do, but Lord, it's not based on what we do. It's based upon who you are. God, you are God, and you are greater than any problem we face. Lord, you have more power than anything we've ever known. God, you have abundantly more power and more ability than we've ever thought to ask or imagine that you have. And Lord, tonight we pray that revival would begin in the hearts of every person here. And God, that you would overflow out of us as you flow through us into this world. And God, that we would be faithful to preach a kingdom of small things that you're growing a huge harvest from. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we sing and you be obedient, if God is speaking to your heart, and as he speaks to your heart, you come. Someone needs to be saved tonight. You don't know Jesus. You would stand before him in eternity, and you would be destined for hell and punishment. This is your opportunity tonight to surrender to him by faith and ask him to save you, and he will do that. You come right now. God's calling you. You're a Christian, and there's something God's put in your hand, a small seed a small offering, a small gift, a small, a small opportunity, and you say, well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> nobody will even notice if I do that, and nobody will notice if I don't. But listen, you know, and God knows. And God wants to do something great in those small things in your life. We're going to sing about the wonder of God, but God's not truly wonderful expressed in your life if you turn your back and reject Him. Let's sing, and let's be obedient right now. This is your moment. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King. Master of everything.
Amen. We're going to close in a word of prayer. We don't normally do that, but we're going to close in a word of prayer tonight. We're going to pray for uh, those who are sick, those who are sick in our church. I got a prayer request before we started church tonight that a former pastor from this area and his wife are both sick. Uh, Tommy and Mary Lynn Crowder are both sick, and uh, some of you know them very well, and some of you know them just by stellar reputation as servants of God. And so we want to lift them up in prayer tonight as well as others in our church family who are sick. We want to praise the Lord for those who've been healed and are progressively being healed. And let's pray for our country and our community and our society. And sometimes we pray for the government. We should, but we need to pray for our, our, our world is what we need to pray for in spiritual lives of each one who's a part of it. So let's go to the Lord in a time of prayer as we dismiss. Uh, Brother Joey, would you lead us in prayer for dismissal? God bless you and keep you until we meet again. Hopefully see you on Wednesday. Invite somebody to come be with you.